Welcome to a new vlog. Today we're going to attempt to repair these two Shelly relays. Now these are the older Shelly 2.5 model. It's just a basic two channel relay. And as you might be aware, if you're following the channel, I basically have a Shelly relay controlling each one of my lights and some of my sockets. Now this lets me automate things, which is pretty nice. These two were installed about the same time, let's say about four years ago, and they failed pretty much within a couple of months, one to the other. The failure mode is that they no longer reliably hold a Wi-Fi connection, and there is a hissing sound coming from the inside. Now, if you're an electronics engineer, you hear a hissing sound, you immediately think there is something wrong in the power supply circuit. If I hear a hissing sound and I know my device is not holding its Wi-Fi connection anymore, I'm thinking the PSU supplying the 3.3 volt rail to the ESP32 device inside is uh, you know, either bad as in out of spec, cannot deliver the current or maybe to the point that the chip keeps resetting or um, it's just high ripple that's affecting the normal operation of the chip. This is not uncommon, especially for these older generation Shelly relays. In fact, if you go online and do a Google search, you just type in these symptoms, it will tell you this. So this generally means the issue is well known and common to happen, especially as the device gets older and potentially the electrolyte inside um, the electrolytic capacitors goes dry. Now this happens more often with cheap capacitors when they run continuously, especially in higher temperature ranges, which is the case here because, well, I'm pretty sure they use cheap capacitors inside these and they're packed tightly together inside this small enclosed device. So the capacitors surely run hot inside and I have seen a bunch of these fail um, but granted, these are the first ones that are failing inside my uh, apartment. I have seen them fail um, on uh, a friend's uh, apartment. But what I do find particularly interesting is that when I mentioned this to the uh, Shelly team at the Embedded World in Germany, because I visit the trade show every year and because I've seen this failure mode happen to other people and I've seen it mentioned online, I actually brought it up to the Shelly team at their booth well, they acted very surprised. They said it's not at all on their radar as a common failure mode. I guess it depends how you look at things. If you just consider uh, this to be your responsibility for the first two years covered under warranty, then yeah, maybe the failure rate is pretty small, but I would not consider normal to be replacing your relays every two years, you know? Anyway, let's open one of these up and try to confirm the problem. Opening the case is uh, fairly simple. It's just held together by clips uh, around the edge. Just be careful when inserting a pry tool because uh, those clips can break and just don't insert the pry tool too deep inside the device because it's tightly packed with components and we don't want to be uh, damaging any of those. Yeah, so pretty much the clips are located here, here, here and here. Also be really careful when pulling the circuit board out of the enclosure because there's this really, really tiny coax cable connecting the antenna and you don't want to be ripping that one off. And another word of caution, don't try to do this with the device powered on from AC mains. It's just too risky if you don't know what you're doing. And also immediately after being unplugged from mains power, there could still be some energy left uh, charge into these capacitors so you know make sure you, you give it like half an hour so that it fully discharges first of all here is a sample of that hissing sound and it appears to be coming from the capacitor area if we look closer at the board we have two 4.7 microfarad capacitors 400 volt 105 degrees c rated and there is this one 100 microfarad 16 volt 105 degrees C rated. Now I'm guessing uh, the 4.7 microfarad 400 volt rated ones are the ones that failed, but to ensure I don't have to open it up again in the future, I'm gonna be replacing all three of these electrolytics. And the first step is to remove these capacitors. And there are a number of ways for doing that, but you're going to need some uh, fresh solder, a soldering iron, and optionally some gel flux, which will make your life much easier. I'm using the Sturry brand because it's the best. First, 
bend the capacitors to be vertical, then I'm going to be using a wide soldering tip, temperature set to 380 degrees Celsius. I'm going to add a little bit of fresh solder uh, that helps and heat up both capacitor pins at the same time. It helps if you have one of these wider soldering tips like I'm using here, a blade tip. So while heating both of the solder joints, I'm pulling from the other side, removing the capacitor. Now I did a quick uh, measurement on these, physical measurement, and the 4.7 microfarad capacitor measures 6.5 millimeter in diameter by 12.8 millimeter tall uh, with 2.5 millimeter pitch, while the 100 mic capacitor measures 5.1 diameter by 11.5 millimeter tall with 1.5 millimeter pitch. This is really important when ordering replacements, otherwise they won't fit. You'll also notice these capacitors have their polarity marked and this is important when fitting new ones in. Don't install them the wrong way around. When looking for alternatives, search for 105 degrees C rated caps, a high number of rated operating hours and definitely if you can find them from a known good manufacturer like Fujicon, Panasonic, Nippon Chemicon, Nichicon and others. Ideally, don't buy your caps from AliExpress, get them from a known distributor like Mauser, Fernell, DigiKey, or even an Asian distributor like LCSC will give you better quality than AliExpress. What you'll notice uh, if you start searching for this is that it's not common to find the 4.7 microfarad 400 volt rated cap in a 6.5 millimeter diameter, as they are usually at least 8 millimeter wide at least from the known good manufacturers. The problem is you can't fit two of these uh, if they're 8 mm diameter capacitors in place of the original. They just won't fit unless, I don't know, we cut some opening in the enclosure, which is something I don't want to do. So I had to resort to using less known Chinese manufacturers and my selection uh, boiled down to the Min brand because it seemed to have the most a uh, professional data sheet and it wasn't cheap and it has good ratings at least on paper. This particular capacitor from their LKM series is rated for 105 degrees uh, Celsius and 9000 operating hours. For the 100 microfarad 16 volt 5 by 11 millimeter this one is actually a more common size and I found a good Nippon Chemicon replacement in the right size 105 degrees C rated so I, I ordered both of these from LCSC. And because I ordered these right before um, Christmas, uh, I also got some nice discounts. So a bunch of these caps ended up costing me less than $10 shipped. But just for fun, I did some measurements using an LCR meter on the old capacitors to see how their parameters look like. These are the two 4.7 mics. As you can see, their capacitance is way lower than 4.7 microfarad and their ESR has skyrocketed. And things are not looking any better for the 100 microfarad capacitor, which is measuring 700 nanofarad. And look at that huge ESR. So after seeing this, I would say the um, 100 microfarad cap was the culprit because it was so badly degraded and also because it's on the output of the converter but as a good measure it's just best to replace all of them to give this device a new life and now through the magic of editing i got my parts and we're ready to install them i'm gonna insert all of them just to check if they all fit first then i'm gonna make sure i'm getting the polarity right and yep they seem to fit nicely Next I'll apply a tiny bit of flux to help with soldering and in a few seconds I have them securely soldered in place. Next I snap the leads flash with the PCB and clean the soldering job with a bit of flux cleaner but you can also use isopropyl alcohol if you don't have a dedicated flux cleaner. And before powering up just make sure that there is no um, solder bridges between the pins of the uh, capacitors and that you have not damaged any surrounding components. After a quick test on mains power, I was able to confirm that there is no more hissing sound from the relay and it seems to connect to Wi-Fi and the connection is stable, operation is good. So I would say we have a uh, successful repair and I just uh, need to perform the same on this other relay and possibly on the third one which hasn't failed yet. Now, my feelings on this on the end of the video are a bit mixed. I think Shelly should really acknowledge this is a common fault and they should put better parts in their future revisions or new products to prevent this from happening. These devices are not exactly cheap and people trust using the Shelly brand and consider them better than 
Chinese alternatives, but that can quickly shift if they don't take action. I hope this video was useful if you're having a similar issue with your Shelly Relay. If it did help you repair your Relay, or at least diagnose it, uh, please give it a thumbs up and leave a comment below to let me know. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.